Hello everyone. Uh, I would like I would like to welcome you in our symposium. Uh, is a voice for over for you, Professor Fukami. Uh, over for you to, to talk. Hello everyone. Uh, I am now Kukami, the director of Japan Society for the Promotion of Science in uh, the research station in Taiwan. Uh, thanks to, to join uh, our the, the webinar lectures. And at the first, I read on behalf of the president of JSPS, Professor Susumu Satomi. He was the director of Tohoku University Hospital from 2004 and the president of Tohoku University from 2012. After he became the president of JSPS on 2018, for this webinar about COVID-19, he is the best person for the opening speaker, though he could not join uh, in his busy schedule. I am very sorry. So, uh, a, mo a moment, please. Mm. I am very pleased that this milestone symposium can be held under the joint sponsorship of uh, JSPS and the Egypt National Research Center with the cooperation of the JSPS Alumni Association of Egypt. At the opening of this symposium, I would like to extend our appreciation to all of the many supporters. I would also like to uh, extend a word of thanks to invited lecturers. As you may know, uh, JSPS is Japan's core research funding agency, established in 1932 for the purpose of prom promoting science as part of its mission to build strong networks for advancing international joint research. JSPS Mm, uh, has established 10 overseas offices in nine countries around the world. These offices serve as Japan's science embassies in the host countries and regions. As such, uh, they promote and facilitate scientific exchange, uh, disseminate information on scientific activities and developments on in Japan, support uh, Japanese researchers uh, laboring abroad, and coordinate with JSPS alumni associations among various other functions. Among our uh, overseas offices, the JSPS Kai Research Station is one of with the longest history. The present center was established back in 1984. It serves as JSPS core hub in the North Africa and Middle East regions. Beginning with Egypt, the Cairo office served serve the country by sustaining 
exchange uh, between them and Japan. The office employs a of activities in carrying out this mission. We at the uh, JSPS will continue to work through our Cairo research station to sustain and develop a cooperation with the related institutions in ways that further contribute to mutual advancement of scientific exchange. I have heard uh, that the researchers from various countries, including Egypt, India, Japan, Morocco, Brazil, and the United Kingdom will deliver lectures on the topic of COVID-19 from their own perspectives to solve the current crisis. Each of us should remain extra cautious about the present COVID-19 threat posed on the global scale. Beyond that, knowledge sharing and collaboration between healthcare professionals and researchers are essential. I believe that this symposium will contribute to such efforts and provide all of you a very fruitful experience. Uh, Japan has overcome the enormous damage from the major earthquake on March 11, 2011, which was followed by the tsunami and the nuclear accident. Ever since, it has continuously fighting against the natural disaster such as torrential rain disasters and earthquakes that occur every year across the country. I hope that COVID-19 pandemic will also be beaten in the foresee uh, foreseeable future. Lastly, I wish to extend a word of thanks uh, to Dr. Naoko Fukami, director of the JSPS Cairo Research Station and her staff for the great effort they put into pre preparing this symposium, uh, looking forward to flourishing of scientific exchanges between Egypt and Japan. I extend heartfelt wishes for health and safety all attendees. Uh, at first, I want to add our feeling of gratitude to many lectures all over the world, amongst them to Professor Dr. Mohamed Hashim, President of National Research Center, who accepted to collaborate, the collaboration willingly. And I want to appreciate the effort of Dr. Wara Saad. She planned, the, planned this wonderful opportunity where many scientists think about COVID-19 together with the support of Professor Ibrahim Tantawi, the president of our alumni, and the Professor Gad el Kadi, the president of NARIAJ, and also our alumni board member. Uh, thanks for your listening, and I wish the series of webinar lectures would bring about a fruitful and meaningful approach and outcome to our new generation living with corona. And, the, uh, and we believe someday in new future when we might overcome COVID-19. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fukami. So the, I, would, I would like to welcome Mrs. Kamiyama, Japan Embassy, the, uh, the uh, talk for you now. Hello. Did you hear? Yes, I hear you. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Professor Dr. Muhammad Hasim, President of National Research Center. Uh, Dr. Fukami, Director of Japan Society for the Promotion of Science in Cairo. Professor. Uh, unmute your mic. Okay, yes, I'm sorry. 
So um, I was mentioning the reviewing uh, seminar. So uh, again, Professor Dr. Muhammad Hassan, Dr. Sami, and Professor Dr. Elkhadi, President of National Research Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And also Professor Dr. Ibrahim Kantari, uh, President of JSPA Alumni Association in Egypt. Dr. Warasa Kanti, distinguished professors, ladies and gentlemen. Again, good afternoon. My name is Kamiyama, Director of Information and Culture Center, Embassy of Japan in Egypt. So, um, let me express my sincere gratitude to the cooperation of all the stakeholders to provide a valuable opportunity to discuss a very timely topic amid the spread of COVID 19 causing a human security crisis worldwide. This symposium today offers us a valuable occasion where we can share our views on common interests and seek ways of cooperation. It is impossible for any single country to confront the threat and address it effectively alone. International cooperation is essential to combat COVID-19 and Japan is determined to work together with others. On the premise of achieving this goal, I should stress the importance for all the countries and organizations to share information and knowledge in a free, transparent, and prompt manner. It should be also taken into consideration that we have to find a balance between resuming social and economic activities and taking appropriate measures to contain COVID-19 at the same time. I think we have not found a perfect answer so far, but at least it is important to share our experiences and our good practices and combine the wisdom obtained from them. Um, now, let me quickly touch upon the latest situation in Japan. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the number of deaths has been a little over a thousand in Japan, which is still significantly lower than most other developed countries. The state of emergency was lifted on May 25th, and we're in a process of reopening our social and economic activity step by step. Japan has been taking a science-based approach, encouraging the general public to avoid the situations to create clusters, to do such actions as hand washing, wearing masks, using disinfectant to clean surfaces, and ensure proper ventilation when indoors. The situation was a little relaxing in June, but as you may be aware, we are looking at a new alarming situation where the number of infections has been increasing, uh, increasing over the past month. The number of confirmed cases should rapidly rise, and now we are paying close attention to 1,500 confirmed cases for a number of days. However, the situation is quite different from the one in April, as we currently have a much smaller number of patients experiencing severe illness than in April. At the peak in April, there were over 100 severely ill patients in Tokyo, and now there are only around 20. Um, since the beginning of June, people in their 20s and 30s have made up 70% of all new cases, which was not the case in April. We are now taking a couple of new approaches and countermeasures. First, expanding testing capacity, increasing the expansion of PCR tests, antigen tests are available. They now have the same approximate accuracy as PCR tests. The results are available at a short time, and the tests are covered by the health insurance. Second is the targeted countermeasure focusing on specific groups or business, which has seen some clusters before. We encourage a wide-scale proactive PCR testing for employees of those specific business, even if they don't have any symptoms. Third, we are strengthening the capabilities of local public health centers, providing these facilities with additional public health nurses to perform appropriate activities within an important step. In addition, AI simulations are proving to be very helpful 
providing us with valuable information about how the virus can spread, as well as just how effective countermeasures such as masks are in reducing the risk of infection. We are expecting more to come. To conclude, I highly praise and appreciate the contributors and participants of today's symposium. Through the series of discussion, we will learn from the report and insights of experts in a broad spectrum of sectors. We come to obtain an overall view of what is going on, asset by asset, and what could possibly be done. And with the challenge, maybe, but it may also be proving the value and worth of certain principles and approaches, like human security, social resilience, and universal health coverage. It may also be presenting opportunities, such as enhancing and updating the health sector. Hopefully, today's occasion can help us all cope with the epidemic and its impact in the world. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for your points. Uh, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Gad al Audi to the group his book. Would you please, Dr. Gad? Okay. Uh... Good morning, good afternoon for everybody. I know the time difference between uh, many of the speakers. It's my pleasure to, to be here today with you giving uh, address uh, speech to this very interesting symposium. At the beginning, I would like to thank uh, Japan site for the promotion of science for uh, allowing us to have this uh, symposium and especially Dr. Wala Saad, the or, or, uh, coordinator of this workshop for, the, for her uh, endless effort to get all the speakers uh, worldwide and these interesting topics. Uh, first of all, uh, you know this uh, a very unprecedented and expect, unexpected COVID-19 pandemic uh, caused a lot of troubles worldwide for the concern of economy, of education, of science and technologies. And there was a lot of challenges how to uh, face such uh, huge and quick, very fast breeding for this uh, pandemic. Uh, started uh, in China and lasted with uh, America and a lot of countries had faced a lot of uh, victims and this toll was rising uh, every day. Uh, for the science and technology community, all of you here, and that was the idea behind this uh, symposium, how to serve our community, how to get uh, a vaccine in a very short time. I know there is a lot of efforts worldwide. Uh, a few days ago, Russia had announced that uh, they got uh, already a vaccine and now is in trial uh, uh, basis for this uh, COVID-19. Uh, so in, in this uh, workshop or symposium, which will be extended for the next uh, four or five days, uh, we'll be happy to hear from you a lot of uh, efforts going on uh, worldwide in, the, in, in, in this direction. However, I would like to uh, emphasize and highlight the main issues behind uh, this uh, gathering, the challenges in science and technology uh, we need to address uh, a lot of issues for uh, health and medicine in considering, of course, as, as a science, uh, the strategic uh, development goals for the United Nations. We need to consider online educations and the infrastructure for this one in different institutions worldwide. A lot of countries, even some cities, don't have uh, the internet. I would appreciate if you mute uh, other non-speakers. Uh, again, uh, having uh, uh, international community, as all of you here today, it will be good to get uh, close discussion as well as uh, highlight and summary for points for action uh, to be uh, considered for near future in our institutions. I would not like to take lo a lot of time because we are almost behind the schedule. Uh, again, I would like to thank Jess Best for uh, taking uh, this uh, opportunity to consider this uh, workshop. 
Dr. Wala Saad, Dr. Ibrahim Tantawi, and all speaker uh, will be uh, will 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 give a presentation for next few days. Thank you very much, and I'm very much looking forward to conclusion of this uh, symposium. Thank you. Many thanks, Dr. Raget. Thank you for your talk. <clears throat> we are waiting for from the National Research Center. Uh, they face some in, uh, in registration and tingling the web. So uh, if they couldn't come for uh, saving our time, I will present the um, talk of NRC uh, till they can join the meeting. It's okay. Uh, now uh, I, I would like to welcome Dr. Ibrahim Tantawi. He 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 is us now, Dr. Ibrahim. Ibrahim, you hear me? It's okay. So so I uh, I uh, I suppose to uh, to, to tell, <coughs> give the talk of NRC now. So just a minute. Uh, until uh, Dr. Wala be ready. So the, the next speaker are ready for your presentation. Okay. Well, would, you, would, you, would you like to try uh, testing, sharing the screen? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Shall you try? Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Walla, if you just share the screen with my presentation. Maybe Dr. Okay. Fukami. Okay. okay, Dr. I will share. I will give the uh, NRC uh, uh, talk and we'll share your presentation now. Okay. I made you uh, the co-host so that you can use your computer. Yes, yes, Dr. Dr. Uh, uh, Professor, Professor. Uh, well, you can you can share your screen. Yes, yes. You can do that. Yes. So uh, the NRC uh, world. Professor Dr. Muhammad Hashim is the president of the NRC. Uh, uh, he wanted to express his apologies because he faced some problem in uh, entering the uh, webinar Zoom now. But Dr. Mamdouh Maud and he he will uh, join us later. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Kimiyama, Embassy of Japan, Director of GSPS, Cairo Office, Professor Fukami, Professor Dr. Gad Al Adi, President of the Raj, Professor Dr. Ibrahim Tantawi, the President of GSPS AAE, and Dr. Wala Saad, Coordinator at Moderator of Symposium. Distinguished delicate lady and gentlemen, give me great pleasure indeed to welcome all of you and be with you today in the opening of ceremony of this important webinar lecture, Symposium entitled COVID-19 and Sustainable Development Goal, Sciences and Health Challenge. Sustainable Development Goal were adapted by all United Nations member states in 2015, included our country, Egypt. These goals are universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. Since November 2019, the world started facing global health crisis 
unlike any other, it's a COVID-19 pandemic health crisis. This crisis is spreading human suffering, destabilizing the global economy, and abandoning the life of billions of people around the globe. COVID-19 crisis requires a whole of government and a whole of society response urgently and sufficiently. This is symposium addresses this crisis on the sponsor of GSPS Cairo office, Egypt, and in collaboration with National Research Center, as well as GSPS Alumni Association in Egypt. It's our clear pleasure to release this important event to discuss scientifically and with multidisciplinary field of sciences, this pandemic crisis and how to overcome its impact. This symposium address also how we can complement and collaborate all together to successfully reach the aim of goal number three, health of sustainable development goal. We're ensuring health lives and promoting well-being at all age is essential to sustainable development. Thank you with my best wishes a success of this symposium. Thank you. So, now, Dr. Uh, Abraham, I will, I will, if you, if you face any problem to share your screen, I will share screen for you. So, this yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. So, uh, you will try or I will share your screen? You, 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 you try. You try from your end. Okay. Please, just one. Ah. Uh. So if it is my turn, let me first... Uh, uh, Hi. Hello. Is it ready? I'm good. Yeah. Just waiting. Should it is okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I want it to be very hot. I put this. Wait. This is mine. Ah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Hi. You. You. Submit your paper? No? When? At least the uh, after tomorrow. <laughs> Very safe. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because you know the presentation. Yeah, too far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See you. See you. Yeah. I'm sharing it now, doctor. Yes. Go to the full screen. Thank yeah. you very much. You are welcome. Uh, am I? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, sure. All right. Okay. okay. So let me first congratulate the Dr. Walla for organizing this very interesting as well as successful seminar. So, yeah, I, I shall tell you. But, all right. Okay. okay so okay, the okay. webinar. It's all webinar on COVID-19 and sustainable development goals. Now, this is going to be a very, very time, appropriate time. And I really congratulate the organizers, National Research Center, NRC of Egypt, and Japan Society for Promotion of uh, Science, JSPS, Research Station, Cairo. I really like to uh, thank Professor Dr. Ibrahim Tantawe, the president, Dr. Fukami, the director of JSPS Cairo, Dr. Gad El Kwadi, the president of NRI AG, the ambassador of Japan in Egypt, and also uh, Dr. Walla. So I shall now try to start my understanding of the SARS CoV 2 new dimensions. So I am from a university in India, uh, from Kolkata. My name of my university is Sister Nivedita University. So I shall mainly stress on the infection part. And I, in this infection part, it is becoming very, very important to find out that it will, how it is going to lead us to find out a lot of different types of researchers. Next slide. The virus as the first disease, say it's doing disease for a long, long period of time. But the discovery of the first human virus 
was done in 1908 with yellow fever virus, which dominated the world between 1901 to 1928. Discovery of the first coronavirus is the avian infectious bronchitis virus, was in 1937. And still there is a controversy about the discovery of the first human coronavirus, a strain B814 in 1961. The strain is currently lost. Next slide, please. So the first person to isolate a strain of coronavirus called D229E was done by Dorothy and Dorothy Hambre a virologist and infectious disease researcher at the University of Chicago Department of Medicine in 1966. Then in June, in June Almeida, working at the Britain's Common Cold Research Unit in Salisbury, they first produced the first image of the virus in 1967. From that time onwards, there are seven different human coronavirus species exist today. And you know, the last one is actually the one which is now the reason for the pandemic, SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. Now, as this particular COVID-19, you can see that this coronavirus disease, which in 2019 is a pandemic caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, also called SARS-CoV-2. And you can see that it affects the lung trachea, broker, and ultimately the alveoli. And if you look at the healthy alveoli, you can see that it is almost empty with, it's very important to find out the different types of exchanges takes place over here. Once it's infected, you can see that the virus starts accumulating in the alveoli. And then in the moderate infection, you can see this alveoli is partly filled up with the fluid. And when it is a severe case, you can see the whole alveoli is completely filled up with this. Next. So in that particular case, you can see the gas balance where you can see the red blood cells release carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen. And there are two types of alveoli cells, type one and type two. Type two cells secrete the surfactant. Next. And when it actually find out the viral infection, the spike proteins covering the coronavirus bind ACE2 receptors primarily on the type 2 alveolar cells, allowing the virus to inject its RNA. The RNA hijacks the cell, telling it to assemble many more copies of the virus and release them into the alveolus. The host cell is destroyed in this process and the new coronavirus infect neighboring cells. Next. And thereby we could see there is completely impairment of gas exchange. Alveoli collapse due to loss of surfactant type two cells, less oxygen enters the bloodstream and more fluid enters the alveolus. So in that way, the infection proceeds and go to the severe symptoms. Next slide actually is going to demonstrate that the immune response on the part of host so right after infection, the type 2 cells, they release the inflammatory signals that recruit the macrophages, which is called known as the immune cells. The macrophage release cytokines that cause vasodilation, which allows more immune cells to come to the site of injury and exit the capillary. The fluid accumulates and dilutes the surfactant. The neutrophils are recruited to the site of infection and a lot of reactive oxygen species are released to destroy the infected cells. Now type one and two cells are destroyed leading to the collapse of the alveoli and causing this acute respiratory distress syndrome. But if the inflammation becomes severe, the protein rich fluid can enter the bloodstream and travel elsewhere in the body causing systemic inflammatory response syndrome. SIRS, SIRS, and the SIRS may lead to septic shock and multi-organ failure, which can have fatal But at, to reach that particular stage, it is very difficult. And that's why we could see the mortality is very, very less. But if we can actually 
arrest the virus infection before this will not go up to the death stage. Next slide. But it's very interesting to find out that COVID-19, it discriminates age, gender, immune system fitness, the pre-existing diseases, and the epigenetic factors. So I shall discuss now a little bit about these things. Next slide. Next slide. So in an invader's impact, it was found that in the organs which are affected are actually, you can see it causes the acute cardiac injury, causing the CVD, hypertension. It causes acute kidney injury, causing chronic kidney disease, creatinine level goes up, burn, urine output. Acute liver injury, there is ALT and AST differences. The diabetes, and there are other organ injuries like brain, testis, eye, etc. Now, this blue line indicates the association between the pre existing chronic disease and COVID 19 severity. And the red line, they indicate the organ injuries. And the other expression of ACE2 in the indicated organs is indicated by the ACE2, which is a angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Next slide. Now, the COVID-19 fatality risk, there is an epigenetic dysregulation of the immune system and of the renin angiotensin system, RAS, which may be increased fatality risk. A variety of biological clocks have been shown to predict human health and longevity more acutely than <laughs> chronical, chronological age. And better than their chronological age is thought to be undergoing accelerated things. And that cause increases the risk of COVID-19 fatality. So I can tell you, the individuals who live healthy lifestyles and consume geroprotectors, such as metformin, resveteral, and NAD boosters may have decreased risk of fatality. And in this epigenetic regulation, we find that it controls immune response. And in case of the dysregulation, you can have the immune senescence, the inflammation, and biological age is much greater than the chronic age. And thereby, I could find the environmental factors and comorbidities actually did a lot of its importance. So that is what we call as a cytokine storm. Next slide. Now this epigenetic mechanism in SARS-CoV-2 susceptibility, this is a uh, cartoon which says the expression of the ACE2 gene and the interferon gene depends on the methylation rate of the CPG islands in the DNA promoter sequence. Susceptible individuals, mostly men, the elderly, the smokers, show a hypomethylation pattern. Whereas women, children, and non-smokers show DNA hypermethylation and lower and interferon proteins. The high presence of ACE2 on epithelial cells and interferon makes people more susceptible to the infection and there is increased disease severity. Whereas a low presence of ACE2 and interferon seems to offer disease protection. Unfortunately, recently certain strains are coming out by the mutation whereby we could see that even the children are getting affected with COVID-19. Next. Next slide. So why does COVID-19 disproportionately affect older people? You know that in the agent system, which uh, they are actually reaction is initially slow, resulting in greater viral replication, defective macrobiome. So anyway, if T, your immune response is less, it causes greater viral replication. The defective macrophages T cells with a limited repertoire of receptors are less effective and the endothelial cell lining of the capillary becomes inflamed. Fibroblasts are activated. Surge COVID-2 viral components and cytokines enter the bloodstream. 
if it enters the bloodstream, fluid fills the alveoli, reducing lung capacity, virus infection, microvirus, a cytokine storm initiates microvascular clotting, causing severe hypoxia, coagulopathy, and organ failure. And this is how we can find out that there is a disproportionately it affect the older people, that is people above 60. Next. Now, uh, I, I shall not go farther on this. Uh, there are many other reports that are coming that the IgG galactosylation and many other immune systems in the uh, age-related changes, which are also uh, maybe the cause for increased COVID-19 susceptibility. Next slide. Next slide. So the chronology of events, if we look at, we can see that after the SARS-CoV-2 infects the cells, expressing the surface receptors angiotensin-converting enzyme, and another, what is called a TMPRSS2, the active replication and release of virus causes the host cell to undergo pyroptosis and release the damage-associated molecular patterns, including ATP, nucleic acid, and ASC oligomers. Now, these are recognized by the neighboring epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and alveolar macrophages, triggering the generation of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, like IL-6, ip macrophage inflammatory protein, 1-alpha, beta, MCP1. This protein attracts the monocytes, macrophages, and T cells to the site of infection promoting further inflammation with the addition of interferon gamma produced by T cells and establishing a pro-inflammatory feedback loop. Next slide. And then in the defective immune, immune response, this may lead to further accumulation of immune cells in the lungs causing overproduction of this pro-inflammatory cytokines and which eventually damages the lung infrastructure. The resulting cytokine storm circulates to other organs, leading to multi-organ damage and thereby causing the death. Now, in a healthy immune response, the infected cells rapidly cleared, virus inactivated by neutralizing antibodies, minimal inflammation and lung damage takes place, and that results in recovery. Next. Next slide. Now, if we, if we consider the pathological inflammation in patients with COVID-19, you can see that, as I mentioned to you, the alveolar epithelial cells, the CCL to CCL7, they are going to the activated endothelium, or delayed type 1 interferon response, they go to the interferon receptors, or GMCSF, this actually also activates the JAK-STAT pathway. So we call this is as an activated C T cell, as well as the role of the cells, natural killer cells. And this JAK-STAT pathway is actually going to ultimately um, causing the oxidative stress and NF-kappa-B inflammatory genes with all different types of protein kinases and monocyte-derived inflammatory macrophage. And thereby, the cytokine storm where overproduction of IL-6, TNF, IL-8, IL-10, 6, IL-10, IL-1RA are causing the cytokine storm and ultimately the patient's death. Next. Now the question comes that we don't have medicine against it, we don't have vaccine against it, so we have to think about the max, which is absolutely important to reduce the risk of this type of transmission. Because if you know the particle size, 110.1.1, if, if you are infected asymptomatic, infected asymptomatic, that means you are infected, you have the viral replicating, but your immune system is such that it can come back with it. Then the viruses which are coming out, and if you have healthy one, if you have mass, it will not go. But if you don't have the max, there will be an exposure. Now, this particular thing is going to help. But if you have all of the people 
even they're symptomatic, they also have the max, then what will everybody is going to have the minimum exposure. So the whole population right now, whether you have symptom or not, healthy or not, you have to have masks on it to reduce the risk of this transmission of the virus. Next. Next. Next slide. And you know that COVID-2 wreak havoc within the host. Rapidly emerging data are leading to advanced understanding. And in this six months of time in 2020, uh, in the month of July, there are almost 14,573 journal articles on SARS-CoV-2 with 30 retractions and three temporary re retractions. So you can see that science and technology is advancing in such a space. And I thank JSPS because JSPS is also supporting large number of this type of research collaborations on SARS-CoV-2. We should regarding this COVID-2 infection. Next slide. Next slide. So this is one particular paper I find is very important. And in the recently the cell published it. It is a global proteomics of phosphorylation and abundance changes of SARS-CoV-2. It was found. And this was done by the next slide. It shows that this particular number of significantly regulated phosphorylation side groups at the infection time course is, you can see that change. And that is number of significantly regulated proteins across the infection time course also after zero hour, two hour, four hour, eight hour, 12 hours, 24 hours. And there are a large number from platelet degranulation, collagen containing extracellular matrix, platelet dense granule domain, hyaluronan, RNA polymerase to a hollow enzyme, all these things are actually changing in a way or not, either down regulated or up regulated. Next slide. And thereby, we, they could map the different phosphorylation site and identify the localization of this site because this may actually help in developing antiviral molecules. Next slide. Next slide. And when they looked at it, they found that one of the very interesting protein casein kinase 2 is absolutely found to the end protein is also been mapped with the crystal structure. And it is also possible to find out how this phosphorylation changes. Next slide. Next slide. And there are 332 human proteins which gets altered. And there are a lot of clusters of significantly changing phosphorylation sites across the time course of infection with non-redundant enriched reactome pathway terms shown for each cluster. And thereby we can say that the signaling changes in host cells, SARS-CoV-2 infection is really becoming very, very important. Next slide. Next slide. And that changes, you can see that overall phosphorylation change of a protein complex, how actually you can see the Pearson correlation, where you can see minus one to one from deep blue to deep red, you can see the distribution of the different protein molecules over here in the uh, site, which has got the complex and The complex phosphorylation pattern is actually helping us to identify very, very important antiviral things. Next. Next. Next slide. And it's very interesting to find out that the casein kinase 2, if you remember, I'm mentioning to you, the casein kinase 2 and the viral proteins at acting protrusions are co-localized. And that could be done by very nice experiments in the CACO2 cells. And hereby, it is possible to demonstrate that actin and this casein kinase 2, which gets phosphorylated, are actually getting associated with each other. And this co-localization throughout the infected cells uh, infection process is a very interesting fi finding. Next slide. 
Next slide. It is also interesting to find out that surge cov 2 causes cell cycle arrest. And if you look at the cell cycle arrest, it was found that it full change profiles of indicated cell cycle and DNA damage substrates during the infection. And it is very interesting to find out DNA content analysis of cells infected with sars cov 2 for 24 hours compared to the mock infected cells. You can see in the cell cycle, Z0, G1 is being depressed. The S phase is going to activate it. The G2M phase is also activated almost more than 100% in S and G2M. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. So this mapping was done and the mapping regulated kinase to kinase inhibitors was done. So now we know that these are the kinase which can do, so then there are a lot of kinase inhibitors that are available. So why don't we try the kinase inhibitors? You know, the one of the most important drug right now, we are using the remdesivir. And if we plot the remdesivir versus the uh, viral load, you can see the very uh, sharply down more than one micromolar. So one micromolar, more than one micromolar, where the cell viability is not affected, but the viral loads going to be affected is one of the reasons why people are trying with this remdesivir. Other than that, the tassar bead also been used, but it was found it is also have a lot of effect on the cell viability. So it is not a very good one. Next slide. Next slide. So in that way, it was found the Apili mode, Dinazi Silibi, all these actually being utilized right now to find out the active final, this anti. It's very interesting to find out that cell viability is not affected, but Apili mode, even 0 0.01 micromolar is very effective in case of the um, uh, dinosaur, it is greater than 0.1, but so apple mode is another drug right now. People are thinking about how to utilize this. Next. Next. And this is a very interesting paper, which is right now in the pre-proof thing. So it's not yet published that there is an increase in plasma cells in both COVID-19 and the 47 IAV, avian influenza A virus patients. XAF1, TNF, and FAS-induced T-cell apoptosis was found in COVID-19. STAT1 and IRF3 signaling pathways activated in COVID-19 versus a STAT3 and NF-kappa-B in IAV patients. So they studied the comparison between the two, and there are a lot of interesting observations that are coming out and been going to be published in a very important journal called Immunity. Next slide. Next slide. Now, the, uh, 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 there are certain breakthroughs regarding the vaccine, and you know that number of, as mentioned already, that Russians are claiming they are already being testing a vaccine, which is actually may come out. Uh, but besides that, we know that it's Oxford vaccine trial and the vaccine trial in US and China. They are, many of them actually reached the phase three. And here the New England Journal, which actually announced about the mRNA vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. And then recently in the Lancet paper, in the last uh, week, uh, you have a lot of other important things which are coming up. So next slide, next slide. And it's what's the risk you can find out that there is a greatest concern for the world at the economic and the societal and the geopolitical, the technological and the environmental and everywhere it is affecting. So we have to get how actually to combat this particular demon. And that is why research and parallelly 
our knowledge is becoming very, very important. Next. Uh, the one previous to this. So previous to this, previous slide, please. Previous slide, please. Yeah. But over here, I want to, it's a global phenomena, the COVID stigma, the racial stigma, blaming community for the current situation, the violence against the health workers. All of these things we have to fight. We have to fight being kind to the affected individuals. We have to depend on facts and not rumors. We have to spread the awareness regarding the do's and don'ts as endorsed by our health workers. And also very important is providing mental health care. And thereby I shall go to my last slide where I just like to say, next slide. Every problem makes us creative. Every challenge offers opportunity. Let us be resourceful and cater to the demands of humanity. Stay safe, stay home, stop coronavirus, stay positive. So I shall give first huge thanks to the healthcare workers on the front line in this coronavirus pandemic. I shall give thanks to JSPS and the organizers and specifically Dr. Walla and the faculty members, as well as all the people who are attending, all these 26 people who are participating in this seminar so far. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear uh, Chancellor. It's a very interesting uh, lecture and very interesting slides. Thank you so much. So uh, any of the um, attendants have any questions, you can uh, have 10 minutes to, to questions and answer. So please, um, anyone have question? Let me raise your hand, and uh, I will accept the questions. Okay. Yes. No questions. It's okay. I, I have I have a question. <laughs> uh, you talk about um, the viral load and the amount of viral um, uh, amount of virus into the body. So, so, so that is um, um, many, 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 uh, many uh, healthy health provider doctors or uh, nurses or many, uh, a lot of many uh, doctors infected with um, virus get more um, severe symptoms and more uh, deteriorated of health. Um, uh, more exposure. Yes. Because uh, the virus load, amount of virus enter uh, is a body. So, uh, so uh, is this state uh, still uh, uh, current with um, mild symptoms and signs for uh, uh, virus, or is still as uh, severe as uh, first uh, presented uh, on March um, 2020? Yeah. Is so, as I, as, as I mentioned to you, this is actually determined by the R0 factor. And in this particular case, COVID-19 was found to be more infectious, so less number of virus is sufficient to infect a person. But the person's reaction to that is also very interesting. Depends on his immune system, depends on his epigenetic clusters, and all the other different factors I mentioned to you that without any comorbidity or anything else. Now, so the viral load is something which is actually is less in the asymptomatic patients. And then in the first stage of infection, then the viral starts replicating in the system. And as the replication goes on, the viral load builds up and sometimes a person in actually sheds 10,000 per sneezing and that particular load is very high. And the possibility of the persons infected in his surroundings or her surroundings were very, very high. The healthcare workers which they are facing right now, even having this, all the different types of precautions, are sometimes getting exposed to this excessive number of viral particles which are there in this. And that's why we have to take major protection. And we have to, one of the major things we have to think about that you have to be careful that always we should have masks. Because I am asymptomatic doesn't mean that I'm not shedding virus. I'm also shedding virus. Maybe I'm infected, but my system is enough protected. It is not going 
uh, higher. That's why I don't have any symptom. Yes, you are right. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to share... Uh, Other question I could find that there is a... By the, this human coronavirus, they cannot infect the birds. So yeah. the birds have not been infected by human coronavirus. We Any have, other question? Oh yes, so we have a question from Dr. Hayam Nazif um, uh, from Egypt. Uh, uh, yeah. May you introduce yourself, Dr. Hayam? Uh, Dr. Hayam Nazif, Professor of Pediatrics, Faculty of Postgraduate Childhood Studies, Ain't Shams uh, University in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chateau Padjai, for your very informative uh, uh, lecture. Uh, very, very interesting and uh, really uh, great knowledge. Uh, I would like to ask you about your opinion about the term super spreaders. Who are the super spreaders and is this term correct? Uh, we'd like to hear your opinion about that. Yeah, the super spreaders are those, say for example, I have a very strong immune system. So in, within my system, I can come back with the virus, okay? But while I'm talking, while I'm sneezing, while I'm coughing, the virus is coming out through me. I am healthy, so I don't care to have the mask. So then what will happen? I'm always shedding the number of viruses. Now, if these particular people who are actually in my neighborhood, they have a less immune system, or they have a weaker immune system, or their age is higher, or, <laughs> or they have some other comorbidities, the same time, then what will happen? Even the small number of viruses can cause a huge amount of infection. And once it goes inside the system, it will start replicating in such a fast rate that immediately that person will get. So these are the person asymptomatic, but infected are going to be the super spreader. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you, Dr. Hayam. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I wanted to share a slide I didn't share uh, before your um, before your your talk. Uh, this is uh, Doctor. Um, this is biography for uh, for so, sorry. Laura, uh, 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 Hashim Sidi also has a question. Question. Okay. okay. Laura, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. <laughs> It's already done. <laughs> okay. Uh, start, uh, start asking. Professor yes. Hashim has a question. Yes. So uh, please. I have a if possible, yes. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. go ahead, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your very nice presentation. And I have actually two questions. Regarding yes. Lancet and New England of Medicine, the two yes. papers, uh, it has been most drawn after mistakes. I know how tough is the publication in such two journals. We have already one paper already published in Lancet. So I know the impact factor is 59 and the other one is high, even higher. Yes. And the yes. two papers were withdrawn and this is big accident. Yes. Second, did you publish any of these slides by yourself? Do you have any publication of your presentation today? Yeah, so each of these slides at the bottom, you can see the publication is there. Which okay. journal, which uh, issue and everything is there. This is you? Each of this, in each of this particular publication. So, right. No, it's not my work. It's the work I have accumulated from all over the information. As I mentioned to you, almost 15,000 papers are there in this last six months in the reputed journals. Yes, yes, perhaps. So, uh, any questions? The second question. Yes. But I mean, you didn't publish any of this. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. It's not my publication. No, 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 no not at right. all. Right. Then the second question about New England of Medicine and Lancet. Yeah. So, you know that what happened that this time, because of this huge price situation, there are the, all the reviewers, all these journals, they have taken some sort of uh, fast track publications and yeah. due to this the fast track publications the normal way of going to the very very tough review is being exempted and that's why we could see that there is such crisis there are so many and the, you can see that almost 30 papers got retracted in this last six months right that's right thank you very much welcome so any, any questions 
So I, I will share my screen again. He's a biography for Dr. Um, my, ch my, my guest and my uh, uh, best friend, <laughs> uh, Chancellor of uh, Sister Nivedita University, uh, Kolkata, and the founder, Vice Chancellor of MT University, Calcutta, from 2015 2019, to Vice Chancellor uh, of the University, 2008 till uh, 2015, a Fellow of National Academy of Science, and Fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences, Fellow of West Bengal. Academy of Sciences, visiting project scientist research fellow to numerous international research organizations, and recipient of uh, various, award, various awards, and published more than 130 paper international journals, and supervised more than uh, 30, uh, 30 uh, students for uh, PhD uh, program. And, uh, uh, I am, I am very happy to be with you, uh, us today and I would like to uh, uh, give uh, uh, five minutes to welcome uh, our next, um, our next uh, speaker. At first, anyway, thank, thank you, like, Dr. Thank Dr. you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Professor Chatler. You know, uh, 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 I am very proud and I am very honored to accept my invitation to this uh, symposium. Uh, and uh, all your uh, Techno India group uh, and all members of Sister Nivedita University. Uh, I am so honored and uh, very pleased to have you in my speaker list, uh, international speaker list. And I would like to uh, be with us and um, for next two days uh, for uh, Sister Nivedita University member, uh, we have tomorrow uh, uh, two lectures from Techno India group, Sister Nivedita University. Uh, actually, I am so uh, pleasured and um, I would like to uh, express how I wanted to have you today. Uh, and we have another lecture in the third day from uh, Director of uh, International uh, Global Affairs and Relations, Professor Dr. Shumali. So I am so, uh, I would like to thank you so much and stay with us. Uh, I uh, will introduce our next speaker. Uh, the next uh, lecture uh, will be titled The Trust Bridge Between Societies and Scientists, Implementation of Nova Technology to Our Society, Professor Dr. Kuharu uh, uh, from um, University of uh, Kyushum, University, Japan. So please prepare your presentation. Uh, uh, we have uh, five minutes uh, to break. Then we will uh, uh, share screen for your presentation. So stay with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your kind introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, sure. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, your first slide. Yes, sure. Yes, we could see. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so let me start my presentation, okay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I express sincere appreciation for the organizers for giving me such a great opportunity. It's my great pleasure. I'm Akihiro Kishimura uh, from Japan, and uh, I'm a chair of Young Academy of Japan and associate professor of Kyushu University. Today's topic is uh, trust bridge between societies and scientists and the implementation of novel technology to our society. So I'm so sorry, it's, my topic is not so close, directly close to the COVID-19 itself, but I hope you enjoy my talk. So let's, let me begin with uh, my self-introduction uh, and My university is located in the Fukuoka. Fukuoka is the uh, uh, north part of Kyushu Island that is located in the uh, west, uh, east west part of Japan. And I think the, my city is a kind of gateway to Asian 
many Asian countries. It's really close to other Asian countries compared to capital city Tokyo. Here is my uh, brief introduction. And actually now I'm working in the Kyushu University as an associate professor, but my uh, research background is chemistry and now I'm working in the applied chemistry department. And also now I belong to the science promotion, uh, promotion group for science communication. And also I'm chair of Young Academy of Japan. So today I will sum my view from the standpoint of these uh, positions. Let me briefly talk about uh, my research. Actually, my research background is chemistry, but particularly my polymer material, my plastics uh, for nanotechnology and some biomedical application uh, kind of drug delivery system. But here is my research outline. Basically, I myself designed and synthesized some novel molecular components and then such molecules can self-assemble into some nanoscale architecture. And sometimes we successfully obtain the nanoscale capsule to fill with some drugs. And also sometimes we design the nano array and some much more uh, dynamic thing as artificial cells. Here is uh, some schematic representation of my research. Actually, we developed some uh, nano capsules for delivery of some active compounds like drugs, small molecular weight drug and protein or nucleic acid for treatment of some disease. Also, we can target some disease part in the body but uh, our technology is usually based on the nano materials. Actually, I myself have not performed any researches related to COVID-19, but some of my friends are engaged in development of some vaccine based on the messenger RNA delivery system. So anyway, the implementation of this kind of technology to the society, there is an issue of some social acceptance. Here, you can see another cartoon of my research. It's a nanotechnology-based medicine. Actually, to, for those who are not familiar with uh, science, uh, we usually depict our material as a kind of nano robot or nano submarine to deliver some uh, drugs to the target site or do some action at the disease part. But actually, the, this kind of material itself is quite new. So sometimes such new material causes some concern in, to the general public. So that is the issue of social acceptance. So there are some issues like risk assessment or management or, or LC issues or environment health and safety issues. As you may know, in around 10 years before, Nano Jury UK, that is a kind of a movement of citizens discussion on nanotechnology. That kind of discussion is really important to accelerate uh, uh, social acceptance of new nanomaterials. But nowadays, uh, in addition, our material is usually synthesized from some plastic material that causes another issue. Actually, the plastic materials have faced serious situation in the society due to the, some contamination of environment. So scientists should make more effort to gain consensus and trust from general citizens. That means more communication is required. And also, in some cases, the co-creation is one of effective ways. To discuss this point more actively, uh, Young Academy of Japan has some uh, focused discussion about the, those points. Here you can see the main scope and activities of Young Academy of Japan. 
the Wyang Academy of Japan have four different subcommittees. Uh, here you can see some subcommittees. The one is uh, subcommittees here on Future Academia. In this group, we always discuss about the uh, scientific community in the next generation, how to back support the young scientists and how to deal with the uh, current issue in academia. The next subcommittee is building some young scientists network in my country. There are another subcommittee uh, to re, uh, deal with the uh, international network, uh, to build the international uh, network between the other young academy in different, uh, different countries, or sometimes we have some collaboration with the global young academy. And the last one, subcommittee on social collaboration for innovation. In this group, we have intensively discussed about the co-creation of new science with citizens for future innovation and to support the citizens' activity. In that discussion, recently we have focused on the citizen science. Citizen science is usually the activity of the, uh, of the uh, researcher who is not professional researcher. Actually, uh, we last year we joined several international conferences to discuss about that point. Uh, for example, the summit of the G7 science academies. The one topic is a citizen science, and another topic is the science and the trust. That is really, really closely related to the, this point. And also in the World Science Forum last year we joined the discussion on some SDGs issue. And also last year in Japan, we have, we organized some sessions about the citizen science and also the SDGs in the international conference for young researchers and other stakeholders. Anyway, we think about, think that the citizen science can contribute to a different beneficial point. The one thing is a promotion of innovation, particularly through co-creation of or participatory research. And also it can contribute to promotion of science literacy in general public. And also that leads to the obtaining trust in science. This kind of activity is also helpful for deeper understanding of activities and the law and the ability of scientists is the co-creation process. There also uh, the citizen science activity uh, will lead to the discovery of non-stereotyped research and approaches. But actually, the professional researchers cannot cover everything raised in everything raised in the general citizens. And so the, this kind of viewpoint is really important to pioneer the new field of science. Here is some recommendations from the, after the discussion in the summit of the G7 Science Academies. The actually is an important point is a rethinking scientific education for such citizen science activity and also some guideline is required to avoid or uh, to avoid ethical lapses and security risks. Also, uh, we need to enable citizen scientists to adopt existing culture of reporting and assessing scientific contributions to keep the science quality based on the citizen science activity. In that sense, uh, citizen science uh, is a kind of uh, scientist. So usually um, they are uh, interested in science and also they can easily access to some guideline of how to conduct scientific research. But uh, in the current situation, COVID-19 situation, I think it's a kind of participatory research situation. 
but uh, citizens who do not want to join this and do not have science literacy are also falsely involved in this situation. So I think the kind attendant to this kind of activity is required for these kind of people. But uh, who can be a proper attendant? In that sense, I think the academic community can play a key role. Actually, the citizens have usually have some societal issues like COVID issues or other infectious disease or also the other uh, more, more public uh, issues in the, uh, the societies. But usually they ask something for the local government, but in some cases, uh, local government solve some issues. They, they give, actually, they can give a solution to back to the citizens. But sometimes uh, to solve the issues, uh, they need some expert knowledge or some skills to overcome the situation. But uh, actually, there is no effective channel to such experts or academic researchers at this stage in Japan. So I think the, uh, our scientist community provide proper opportunity to empower the citizens' activity and support the uh, uh, solving the issues. For that purpose, we need give some opportunity for open discussion and also uh, how this is interactive communication is really important. So not one way outreach activity is effective. So uh, scientist community should provide more open and fair opportunity for science. That means a citizen can participate in the scientific research. Here's a typical concept of a science shop that was proposed by some researcher of course in Japan and also in some other countries. So this concept is, uh, is depicted in this scheme. So it's a kind of cycle and the users uh, raise some issues to the science shop and the science shop is a kind of coordinator to you know, actually coordinate uh, our professional a partner researcher in the university or as a research institute. And then in the next stage, the science shop set to some collaborative activities opportunity. And finally, they can get some research outcome. That should be open to the society and also it's, uh, it is a return to the users. The actual reason we can contribute to this kind of cycle uh, even in the regional areas to, work, to solve some issues in the local area. I think there, uh, another uh, potential, a potentially useful uh, uh, candidate is a, a public institute like science museums. Here is some example of the activity of National Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation uh, in Japan, Tokyo. And it's called Milaikan in Japanese. This Milaikan considers science and technology as a one of cultures and provides opportunities for all the people to reconsider the role of science and technology in the society and the potential impact on the society. They uh, actually provide a unique opportunity to the uh, visitors to this science museum. They actually, like, um, uh, is open There's some opinion bank. This is a computer-based questionnaire for visitors to Milikan. But this is a kind of uh, participatory process for implementation of new technology to the society. The another opportunity is a dialogue with dialogue between general citizen and professional scientist. Here is an example of a discussion about the novel 
nanotechnology based medicine. So the, this guy and this guy is my friend. And they also this, they have active discussion over that point. Actually, the researchers can, this is a good opportunity for researchers to directly hear the opinion for and impression from general public about their technologies. And sometimes, but uh, no, no, usually the scientists have a optimistic and a really brilliant future image, goal image, but uh, sometimes the uh, general public don't think so. Uh, so. Actually, the future goal is different between the researchers and the citizens. So for example, these researchers think about the, the technology, kind of nanomedicine, uh, can work uh, without any direction of human beings. That means uh, automatically cure the disease. But uh, some citizens li don't like such behavior. They want to know how the nanomedicine works in the body. And uh, so the, not automatically, they, they, they do not expect the automatical cure of the disease. They want to know the uh, process precisely. So that is a much more typical difference between the uh, researcher and citizen on the future goal. So this kind of discussions is really useful. Another uh, important activity of Milaikan is an open lab project. The actual is Milaikan uh, provides uh, its space for citizen participatory experiments. Uh, that is a um, kind of demonstration, a um, kind of experiment um, uh, performed by professional scientists. But uh, the visitors Milaikan can join this experiment and directly have some dialogue to brush up the technology. The researcher can collect voices from citizen directly and also ref they can reflect these voices to the uh, future direction of uh, researches. So the Milikan project can promote co-creation uh, co-creation of some new technology uh, it's a kind of joint research with uh, the citizen and the researchers. It's a really interesting uh, project. The, the benefits of this open lab project uh, is a kind of win-win situation. The two scientists, the research outcome itself is a benefit. There also is obtaining new viewpoint as another benefit. The two citizens, the, uh, the understanding the process, the, it means the visualiz visualization of the scientific process. That is important to have consensus with the new technology. That is a good opportunity uh, to the cities. Also the experience on the some um, collaboration process, or participation process is a really important activity to citizens. Here is some example of such project. Uh, this is an experiment of a much more robots, a kind of robotics laboratory, development of robots. And scientists show some demonstration using their, their own robots. And also the, um, the visitors can join this demonstration and some, uh, they exchange their opinions. And after that, the uh, researchers can update their uh, robots. And this is the research outcome. And then finally, they won some uh, research award in some academic conferences. This is a really good scheme for the, both for the scientists and uh, citizens. But uh, visitors to science museum is, uh, I think it's a little bit biased. Actually, the most of Visitors is uh, really familiar with science and also interested in science activity. But uh, to overcome that point, I think kind of more public institutes like public library 
is useful to provide such opportunities. As you may know, my New York Public Library is a hub of knowledge for innovation. They support some novel business and also their motto is library for the people. Also in Japan, this kind of trend is really hot and uh, some public museums uh, support the library for solving the societal issues. And also sometimes they support the business and also the, to solve the uh, academic, to solve the societal issues by using the, uh, some uh, academic uh, academic collaboration. Actually, they can introduce some researchers in that uh, local area. But that is a good example for the uh, collaboration of your utilization of uh, scientific community and such a public uh, institute. The another issue uh, is uh, inclusiveness. Actually, the, the assistive technology for disabled people, uh, one, here is just one example. The, actually, the assistive technology for disabled people can be developed by researchers having disabilities. As you may know, she is a researcher in the area of accessibility. Her name is Chieko Asakawa. She is an IBM fellow and also is a professor in the Carnegie Mellon University in the United States. Actually, she is blind, but she wants to be independent. The independent means she wants to live without any help of or other people. Then she developed many assistive technology for blind people like digital braille, voice browsers, navigation app for smartphone, and a robotic suitcase shown here to reduce the opportunity of help from others. This is a kind of a citizen based activity, but of course, she is a professional researcher, but the uh, she, she actually uh, solves some societal issues. In terms of diversity and academic freedom, this trend is important and shouldn't be neglected. At the same time, we should be aware that science, same technologies can support disabled people and the disabled people can be an expert in that field. Furthermore, the COVID-19 situation has limited our ability. A lot of technologies assist our daily life and the new technologies have been developed further. And also, we never forget inclusiveness for research and education, even in the normal situation, not only in the COVID-19 situation. You can find such message in some articles published in Nature this year and in May. If you are interested in this article, please check it. She can uh, uh, show some message to uh, the society. Another example is the Institute of Arts Videndi in Ritsumeikan University of Japan. And in their institute, they uh, encourage to uh, encourage the people with some disabilities to do some to do some researches about their own issues they actually they promote the uh, education of young researchers having some disability to get phd degree and that is a, a good oh, uh, how is that is a really good opportunity for uh, the people having some disability to highlight their uh, own issues uh, to other some academic uh, problems. So and finally, they aim at the social proposal and practices based on these activities. And finally, uh, I want to some negative aspect of new technologies. 
the last week I had a lecture uh, by Professor Muraki in my university. He is a researcher in ergonomics field and his research uh, uh, theme is ergonomics, uh, ergonomics for all ages and abilities, including uh, assistive technologies for elder people. There's, uh, you, uh, usually he developed some assistive robots for some elder people, but his concerns are, firstly, people cannot fully adapt to novel technologies even she, she developed a new robot for supporting the elder people. And another concern is that the overuse of technology weakens human abilities. And also some people refuse to use new technology. She is some example, and she is not confident in adapting to uh, some new technologies and also the they, uh, she doesn't like becoming a robot, robot, a part of machine. So here is my final remarks. The new technologies always require people to adapt to themselves in new situations, but that process is not always friendly to all the people. This, that means someone will be left behind. That, cons that is uh, uh, conflicting with SDGs no one will be left behind. So I think the user-based or personalized implementation of a new technology should be considered. And for this end, the citizen science and the co-creation process uh, can contribute. Uh, and finally, this kind of activity brings uh, researchers uh, more, trust to some, more trust from the uh, general public. Thanks for your kind attention. Thank you so much, dear professor, for this uh, uh, nice uh, lecture about the uh, Global Learning Academy and uh, the uh, offers and uh, activity you offered about uh, your society. And uh, it's very, uh, really amazing um, activities. So I, if anyone have any questions, uh, we are welcoming the questions now. Yes. Okay. Yes, I have a question. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Okay, okay, Dr. would you please? Yes. It is really very interesting lecture, informative, and the slides are really attractive and very well expressing your subject. Uh, since you are working in nanotechnology mm -hmm. as one of the application, my question regarding uh, uh, some trials of chloroquinine, the alkaloid compound, which has been tried for uh, treating uh, COVID-19 and the other derivatives. As you know, these alkaloids has been isolated from seminaceous officinalis. Do you think that uh, if we treat such a compound with silver nitrate or with gold to have nanoparticles, it could be useful treatment mm -hmm. from your point of view. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. The actually is that we can design some nanoparticles to deliver some, how do you say, the chemically clear compounds. Yes. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think so. So you think this could be a good idea? Yeah, but I'm not sure about that uh, alkaloid, so... Right. Yeah. Because as you know, usually... Structure. Yeah. Right. As you know, usually the scientist working in nanoparticles formulation mm -hmm. uh, based on extracts, they don't work that much with pure compounds. Why not that you try this way? Mm -hmm. This is my view. The second, I have a good idea related to your slides, especially the application and the interaction with citizens. This is, mm -hmm. I like it very much, but okay. I can send you this idea by email. Mm -hmm. okay. And it can be good collaboration between my group in Sweden and yours as well, if you like, but I can yeah. send it to you by email. Oh, thank you very much. 
Okay, I'm really interested in that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing your email. Sure. Thank you, Professor Shulchan. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, we have for five minutes for break. Then we will come uh, our another sp uh, next speaker. So please, uh, can you stop sharing the, your screen, dear professor? Okay, thank you very much. You are welcome, thank you so much. Thank you. We have five minute break, then we will uh, welcome uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Martin. Uh, and you can share your screen now, if you, if you please. Hello, Professor Martin. Yeah, I hear you. Just okay. let me... You can prepare your uh, slide for the next, uh, next talk. I will share my screen now about uh, your biography. Will you prepare your um, your talk? So our next speaker, uh, Dr. Martin Dominic from uh, University uh, of Andrews, um, UK. The, the title of the presentation, Open Science and Public Trust, What is the Challenge? So prepare your presentation, please. You have to unshare your screen before I can share mine. You are welcome. Just let me know when I should start. Okay, you can start now. Please. Okay. Is there a link between open science and public trust? And what's the challenge? Let's go directly to the core of the issue. Sausage. Which sausage would you eat? The one whose ingredients you know or the one whose ingredients you don't know? Which one conveys trust? How can you make a good choice? Was it right to state that laws like sausages cease to inspire respect and proportion as we know how they are made, which is frequently wrongly attributed to Otto von Bismarck, but is actually from American lawyer and poet John Godfrey Sachs? Or is it the exact opposite? How do we build trust in science? And what should we trust in? Can we trust science because it is peer reviewed? Actually, no. The notion of peer review as a gatekeeper and a guarantor of scientific rigor is nothing but a widespread illusion. And in fact, a dangerous illusion. A quite substantial fraction of the academic literature does not meet adequate standards. Such publications cannot be trusted and even more importantly, must not be trusted. If you think that TripAdvisor has, has its issues and does not work well, I would most strongly advise never to trust peer reviewed journals. One can almost always escape scrutiny by playing the lucky card of a more lazy reviewer. As long as one finally finds just one who does not select terrible, broad work will be published in some form. 
Nobody will see the reviews that, ra reviews that raise concerns, nor will anybody know that such exist. Resulting in already identified issues, neither surfacing nor being addressed. It is worth keeping in mind that peer review in the form most commonly practiced serves the journal, but neither the scientific community nor the wider public good. But journals are not all the same. Surely the most prestigious ones apply a more thorough process. Well, that does not hold either. In fact, the retraction rate is positively correlated with the journal impact factor, uh, nicely paraphrased in the statement that I heard, despite the paper being published in Nature, it could actually be correct. Those who are into cheating, they cheat big. They're not publishing in the journal of the Hematological Society of Mongolia. All the big scandals involve most prestigious journals. And their tendency to select research with most spectacular results sets things out along a path that just calls for its own failure. The worse your methodology is on filtering out false positives, the more spectacular results you find. But if we go to article level, surely citations are a stamp of approval. Oh no, wrong again. Citations are driven by social effects. They are not at all objective at source and are a measure of academic popularity of topic, not of quality of research. In particular, citation counts don't hold any information on which parts of a paper are correct and which are not. Work that is spectacularly wrong can attract citations just for that reason. While groundbreaking work initially receives rather little attention, frequently contradicts mainstream opinions and faces resistance. Citations tell you where the masses are. And finding this out is what bibliometrics were invented for. They do not reflect where the most outstanding people derive new ideas. What would you actually tell from the fact that my lifetime citations are only four times those of Albert Einstein. And by the way, if you think that the infamous age index measures something else than the total number of citations, take the square root of the total number of citations and divide by two to convince you that it's not the case. Notably, Web of Science refers to highly cited researchers as the world's most influential ones, which does not say anything about quality. If you have come across influences on social media, you will never suge suggest equating influence with quality. I'm actually most concerned about science following influences because this gives rise to abusive practices. Science needs to face the reality check and the truth cannot be bought by influence. Given that nobody seriously believes that viewing figures of TV programs are a measure of quality, it remains a mystery to me why one wants to believe that citations of scientific articles are. Back to the sausage. There's no basis for trust unless we know the ingredients. Only if we know them, we can make a judgment without having to take someone else's word for it. We will then have a clear reason why we're happy to eat a sausage or why we rather want to stay away from it. Now enters open science, which in my opinion is best summarized as full transparency of all underlying processes. Evading scientific discourse by locking up peer review in a black box is a huge fallacy. 
while we already spend efforts in scrutinizing work, we're withholding valuable information that supports making a well-informed judgment, which consequentially is just detrimental to building trust. The main issue about open science is not on technical details about accessing and sharing information, but on the culture of transparency and constructive open criticism. Do we have something to hide? Well, hiding facts is simply incompatible with the very nature of science. But what if I get something wrong? Well, we all do from time to time. Let me tell you a story. About 15 years ago, I was sitting around over a coffee with some of my colleagues. And I started ranting about the bad quality of review. Using a recent paper I had seen as key evidence, where the reviewer completely missed a severe flaw in fundamental statistics. Well, strangely, one of my friends was always going, Martin, Martin, repeatedly trying to hold me back. Well, because actually he knew who the reviewer was. In fact, it was our most senior colleague who was sitting right next to me. So here's what happened. He had a closer look, got back to me stating that I was right and that he really should have spotted that issue. I gained his respect for my ability of providing proper scrutiny, in particular when it comes to statistics. And all of us had a very good laugh about it. And this is where we need to get to. But even if there is transparency, it does not help building trust if the recipient does not understand what you're talking about. For the ingredients of the meatballs and tomato sauce shown on the top, you can make a well-informed choice on whether to eat pork or not, or stay away from wheat due to an allergy. In contrast, you need some knowledge in chemistry for figuring out what kind of product the ingredient list shown on the bottom refers to. And you might want to stay away if you can't. And indeed, eating liquid hand soap would not be a good move. All too frequently, I see scientists preaching conclusions. However, everybody can do that. Why should scientists be trusted? This entirely misses the point that science is an ongoing process and that evidence matters, not opinion. Scientists are not those who have clear cut answers to everything, but are those who are fully aware of what we don't know. Rooted in the fundamental principle that we can prove something wrong but we can never prove anything right. And the remaining possibilities are those that have not been ruled out. If we want to proceed fast and actually in the right direction, we should take care not to miss any shortcuts. Well, we should avoid any lengthy detours. It is a most serious issue that many scientists tend to accept reported findings uncritically, which in fact goes against fundamental principles on the methodology of science. We're not helped by scholarly publishing that has become right only, and people quoting references that they have never read. The most highly cited publication in my area of research over the last 10 years fails on rigor on several counts. And the main conclusion that has always lacked sufficient evidence has now explicitly been proven wrong. In the meantime, 
many researchers wasted much time on engaging with this work. And it has ultimately undermined cred credibility of the whole field. We need to go beyond publishing and actually communicate and engage in conversations. Is the early sharing of information in form of preprints misleading? No, it's not, because it's part of the process. It is important to understand that a proposition does not yet constitute a fact. We're also too focused on publishing answers. We need to put forward questions. We also need to make efficient use of our collective power in a shared endeavor and explore many directions, avoiding, avoiding getting stuck in dogmata. I would never buy a roadmap that shows only a single road. Recognizing the benefits of using modern technology for sharing information is not a new concept at all. Uh, the Center Bureau of Astronomical Telegrams established a global mechanism in 1882. Combined with open critiquing, this not only supports a much faster process, but also one that controls quality more robustly. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Dr. Martin, for this uh, nice um, presentation. Uh, yes, uh, you are right. So. Yes, you are right. Uh, open science is very important for uh, global um, research sciences. And it's very important to, to uh, uh, know the leave wide gap between science and societies and uh, between scientific uh, research and each other. So I welcome any question if you, uh, if you, uh, anyone have any question for Dr. Martin? Would you please, um, I ask for any questions? So I have one question. <laughs> Uh, you, what about uh, our um, um, COVID-19 crisis now? And this issue uh, is a global issue. How we can uh, narrow the wide gap between uh, what the scientists uh, create or uh, invent or, or discover and uh, another scientist from another uh, country, uh, from another part of the world, how we can uh, know this white gap uh, about publications or about uh, uh, make uh, science open for all. Uh, so would you please uh, answer for these questions? Yeah, I think, I think this, this, this is really, really the question of what platforms the scientific community might want to use for sharing information and, and communicating. I think we, we, we need to, to remember ourselves, remind ourselves, uh, I mean, that the idea of, of journals is just a reflection of, 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 the, of the latest modern technology that was the printing press. Everything that has been invented since then is still completely ignored. We're, we're still following a model of journals which is a model of sharing information from centuries ago. We have, we have other means that, that, that we can use and, and we, should, we should really move the whole idea of, uh, of academic communications, academic publications ahead because there are much better ways of, of, of doing it. I mean, I, I realize that, I mean, working in, in, in astronomy, we're, we're a bit of the, of the, of the lucky ones uh, who've, who've really, you know, uh, we, we process real-time information and uh, 
if you have an astronomical survey that just looks at the sky, detects something interesting, it just can go into, into a direct uh, electronic event feed and you can just you know, write some software to get some robotic telescopes pointing at, 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 at this. And, uh, and, and this, this go, go, goes all, all through. And there are standard protocols for that. Uh, um, we also, uh, publication-wise, uh, we have different means for, for sharing rapid information, which is still in an electronic version of, of, of astronomical telegrams, which just goes over email. Uh, you know, all the astronomical literature is all in the open on preprint servers. Um, so I think it's, it's just about organizing the, the, the community in, 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 in the right way. Yes, I, I actually believe that our symposium today is one way of open science for all uh, over our country sharing is this symposium. Uh, we can share some lectures from uh, UK, from Egypt, from Japan, from Morocco, so, so, so it's from India, sure. There's some sort of uh, 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 narrow this wide gap, but you know, uh, in spite of all this technology and uh, WhatsApp, email, Telegram, uh, 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 Zoom, uh, still uh, some, some, uh, some missed, uh, missed uh, link between sciences all over the world. I think it's an issue of, uh, uh, I don't know uh, about uh, ethically or about um, uh, uh, um, intellectual property. I don't know, but it's still is a gap between what what we what we uh, uh, search about in lab in laboratory and what we publish in uh, for 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 over the world. I hope this gap would be yes. I mean, I mean, my my opinion on on scientific journal, in scientific journals is they will be a thing of the past within less than ten years, because there's actually no reason why this is a format that that we should use. Uh, I mean, the whole idea of pre-publication peer review, uh, the idea this would be, be a gatekeeper for quality, which is only the argument for scientific journals. It's just, it just fails in reality. It doesn't pass any reality check. It just doesn't work. I mean, the pre-publication review is just a gatekeeper for a certain journal. Yes, you are right. Not for the scientific community. It just doesn't work at all. Yes, you are right, Dr. Martin. And we need, we really need to, to communicate. We need to enter, you know, I mean, even if, if you see how things evolved over the last hundred years, if you see the publication of Albert Einstein towards the, uh, uh, towards the concepts of general relativity, it's about 15 to 20 publications. Yes. And every small step and every small idea got published again. Yes. And then you see someone responding. And yes. you see Einstein re responding to himself, saying, well, I thought about this two years, but I actually think something wasn't right in, in what I discussed two years ago. So here's another go. And yes. you see one idea after the other. Now we have the idea that you know, something is published in, in, in a journal. It has to be a ready product. All, all, everything has been addressed. Everything is perfect. And the whole interesting communication that is between the reviewer and the author, nobody sees anymore. And it's so nice to actually see Einstein's ideas okay. developing. And, and, and not, not every first idea that he had was the right one. Okay, I will do. <laughs> thank you, dear professor. Thank you so much and thank you. Uh, no questions. So we will um, introduce our next speaker. Uh, I will share. Uh, uh, screen now. We have uh, five. No, we have five minutes uh, break. So, uh, Dr. Ilham Abedim from Morocco. Uh, she can. Uh, you are with us now. We can. Uh, you can prepare your uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, so uh, you are a researcher from bi in biological science and environment. Uh, she had engineering degree of uh, economic and the veterinary institute. Uh, Dr. Ilham uh, uh, from Morocco, and she is currently preparing her PhD with the University of Muhammad First 
Morakun. She is full member of Organization of Women in Science uh, in Developing World. She is working as a consultant uh, of council in Council of uh, Equity, Equality and Equal Opportunity in Morocco, and she is the president of Association of Sustainable Architecture Culture. So uh, let us uh, welcome Dr. Ilham. If you find any problem to share your screen, I can share you, uh, I can share your presentation from mine. But please share your screen now. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Wala, uh, for your kind presentation. I'm uh, very delighted uh, to be uh, among uh, uh, a plethora of uh, great speakers in the world. And I take this uh, precious opportunity uh, to congratulate and to consider the, all the members of organizing uh, committee especially Dr. Wala Saad and Dr. Nauku. I'm pleased in this difficult uh, and harsh uh, condition of coronavirus pandemic uh, to contribute with you uh, in this wonderful and important scientific event by a topic titled Challenges Facing Agricultural Cooperative at the Age of Coronavirus and Beyond. So first of all, I would like to share with you some statistical uh, data about geography and demography of Morocco. As you see, uh, the Kingdom of Morocco is situated on the northwest tip of Africa with the Atlantic Ocean on one coast and the Mediterranean on the other. Morocco is easily accessible. It is only 14 kilometers away from Europe across the Straits of Gibraltar. Morocco covers an area of uh, seven, 700,000 11 square kilometers with 3,500 kilometers of coastline. The water is mostly the uh, Mediterranean, but is uh, it became more arid and desertic in the deep uh, south. Uh, in this uh, illustration, you can see the Moroccan population is increasing. It is estimated at nearly 37 million of, peopl uh, of people with uh, 5, uh, uh, 51% on female of female according to United Nations data. Yet, the yearly population growth ra uh, rates uh, is decreasing. However, the median age in Morocco is 30 years. We can note also that 62.5% of the population is urban. What about agricultural sector in Morocco? The agricultural sector contributes with 20% uh, to the national GDP. It employs over than uh, 4 million people, including about uh, uh, 100,000 uh, 100, in agro-industry. The sector is directly responsible for the food security of nearly 37 million consumers. This reaffirmed the critical role that agriculture plays in the economical and social stability of our country. This uh, role uh, is uh, developed due or thanks to the relevant strategy which have been uh, adopted by the Ministry of Agriculture. The first one is Green Morocco Plan, focused on two pillars. Pillar one, accelerating development 
of a modern and competitive agriculture throughout the re realization of a thousand new projects with high added value in both production and uh, agro-food. The second pillar, improving the living conditions of the small farmers and fighting poverty in rural areas mm -hmm. by raising agricultural income in the most vulnerable areas, as well as promoting solidarity farming throughout the launching of hundreds of women farmers cooperatives throughout Morocco. Another strategy is a uh, Moroccan generation green. It is also based on two main pillars, enhancing the human elements by promoting the emergence of a new generation of agricultural middle class and encouraging a new generation of young entrepreneurship entrepreneurs by creation of 3,000 1500 uh, uh, jobs. In Morocco, agricultural cooperative has gained the interest of the main programs adopted by the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Rural Development, and Water and Forestry, forest, forests, and can therefore contribute mostly to the to the, the development of agricultural sector and rural area in morocco in this part we'll try to answer to the following questions how can define cooperative especially agricultural cooperative what are history and legal frameworks cooperatives what role can cooperative potentially play in agricultural sector development and our current strategic framework and policy agreements supporting the development of cooperatives. How can define agricultural uh, cooperative? Cooperative is defined by the International Cooperative Alliance Statements and the International Labour Organization as an autonomous, autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, and cult cultural needs and aspiration throughout a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. We can deduce uh, uh, agricultural cooperative is a type of cooperative that unites agriculture, agricultural producers for production or other activities needed by the members, such as processing, marketing, or out of outputs, or supply or supply of the main of production. The legal frameworks on cooperative in Morocco, the first one is the law. The law on cooperative has been promulgated in uh, 2084. Uh, the current law, number uh, 112, created on January 2015, more, uh, is more flexible. It uh, uh, allows to uh, regulate all types of cooperatives, simplifies the registration producers, improves the administration and financial management, allows a flexibility with regard membership and capital to establish new cooperatives. His application it means the application of this law uh, is uh, uh, dedicated to the Cooperative Develop Office, Development Office, ODECO. Legal framework on cooperative in Morocco. Uh, cooperative Development uh, Office, ODECO, is a public institution created in September, September 2062. He, uh, its missions 
uh, or the message attribu uh, attributed to this uh, office by the law, the, the, the list uh, law is to provide cooperative with training, information and legal assistance to finalize advocacy, advocacy and extension work to assist them in their income generating activities. There are other, other legal framework of cooperative action in Morocco, cooperative and their un, un, unions, irrigation water users association, economic interest group, etc. I will take an overview on cooperatives history in Morocco. Solidarity and cooperative practices were known in Morocco centuries ago by first inhabitant Amazir. Uh, I, I give you an example of cooperative practices. Uh, Tuizia is a cooperative of agricultural uh, services. Akuk is another cooperative of water use services. Uh, this, in this board, we can remark uh, uh, evolution, interest evolution of cooperative, uh, especially from uh, 2005 to uh, 2018, uh, 19. We note an increase of cooperative number, more than 80 percent, an increase of Cooperative members, more than 14%, 40%, and 3,500 cooperative created per year. This evolution is explained by the government's commitment to develop cooperatives and integrate them as a part of national economy. There are uh, three uh, chapters uh, which uh, enhance this cooperative, National Initiative for Human Development, Green Morocco Plan, and the least uh, uh, law promulgated uh, to, uh, one, uh, one 112. 12. What is contribution, contribution of agricultural cooperative? Agricultural cooperative, according to the OLECO statistics, uh, uh, contribute with uh, uh, 67, 66 percent uh, in terms of number, uh, is the most represented uh, comparatively in the other uh, sector, economical sector. Uh, agricultural uh, cooperative members, uh, we have 70, 72% and percentage of women's cooperative 14%, percentage of women's members 30%. As you see in the figure, in this uh, illustration, we can uh, about number of cooperative, cooperative members, uh, members, and total cooperatives per subsector of uh, activities. We can note that the size, that the size of agriculture. <laughs> We can note that the size of uh, uh, and number of agricultural cooperatives varies largely across subsector. The dairy, you know here, the dairy subsector is the largest in terms of membership, 15%, uh, with over than 2,000 cooperatives for collection and commercialization of milk, and around of uh, 20 cooperative for milk processing. It is followed by the red, the red meat, honey, and services subsector. Uh, with regard to the social capital of agricultural cooperative per subsector of activity, we can note that in uh, the dairy subsector 
exceeds, exceeds widely the, the others. It achieves more than uh, 400 and 200 uh, MAD million, respectively, in processing and collection. It is followed by Serial, ReadMed, and Surfaces. The strategy and policies in Morocco supporting, supporting cooperatives, uh, in addition to the law, uh, in, uh, is an enable legal framework. We have national relevant strategic frameworks, policy instruments, and investment programs to create a supportive environment to the cooperative development. First of all, the social economy national strategy propose important institutional, legal, and policy uh, reforms concretize, concretizing the principle of solidarity and social utility. The Green Morocco Plan based, as I said, on two pillars. Uh, the first one, intervention on the most productive area with the main objective of developing modern high productivity and high value chain aided agriculture. And the second one, intervention, intervention dedicated to less productive or more remote area with the main objective to, uh, of developing, developing local value chains as a means to improve farmers' income. Third one, National Initiative for Human Development are, uh, is a royal open workshop launched in uh, 2005 to combat, to combat social exclusion. This initiative supports the creation of many cooperatives and helps them to achieve their uh, project generating and improving their income. Other programs like Al Murafaqa, IFAD, International Fund, of agricultural development and agricultural credit bank. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Now I will explain uh, uh, that uh, the I will explain which which are the the challenges. The faced by uh, faced by the, the the cooperative during the coronavirus pandemic, the first case confirmed uh, was in 2 March 2020, and the lockdown announced in 16 March 2020. After this, we have constellation of main shows in Morocco like international agriculture shows, show, national fair of social and solidarity economy, uh, regional expo to terroir products, products. But we have also continuous supply of food to markets. We maintain its supply in fruit, juice, vegetables, dairy, and products. The impact of this situation uh, uh, is according to the cooperative resilience. We note a remarkable impact on small cooperatives due to the, due to the contrast, the contrast of products, products delivering to the market. International agriculture shows. I uh, I want to, uh, to explain or to to give you some note about international agriculture shows of Morocco. Uh, the international uh, agriculture shows in uh, of Morocco is the, the best place for cooperative to sell and showcase their products to the multitude of uh, visitors. Uh, but uh, participating in the show is also being on one of the largest media platform 
for agriculture in Africa. It is therefore an, an accepted opportunity to be now nationally and internationally. About statistics uh, of the, the latest uh, edition, we had uh, some uh, 8,500 uh, 8, visitors and more than 300 cooperatives, more than 1,000 exhibitors, and more than uh, nearly uh, 60, 6, uh, 600 accredited, accredited journalists. The impact of coronavirus pandemic according to the cooperative resilience I start by vulnerable agricultural cooperatives. The pandemic expose, uh, and exposes and exacerbates different forms of inequalities and vulnerabilities. In fact, the preventive lockdown measures led to closure of regional and national shows, uh, closure of processing units like drying and packaging units, thus interrupting the value chain and the, su the sustainability for cooperatives' income. Closer of regional markets, thus making access to commercial platform impossible. Illiteracy of cooperative members is a contrast for efficient use of the, the virtual trading platform when the Wi-Fi is available. Access to this virtual platform is only allowed to cooperatives having an agreement of National Food Safety Office. But we can note that there are some big, great uh, cooperatives uh, which are not uh, so affected by this uh, pandemic, like COPAC, which is a model of resilient cooperative. COPAC is a holding of cooperatives in Sousmessa region in south of Morocco. COPAC is considered a co-mother a co around which revolves 71 regional cooperatives. She has connected small produ for the producer to dynamic local, regional, and international markets. Copag integrates crop and livestock and diversifies its activities to create complementarity between animal produ production, vegetable production, fodder crop production. Create projects this COPAC uh, creates projects and jobs at upstream and downstream of the end production pro product. The reason of COPAC successes are the leadership of the founding, uh, the founding president, former and teacher, and it is uh, its strategy to turn challenges into opportunities. COPAC is the delocalization, de, delocalizing its activities in order to be able to reach more consumer, consumers in the north and central regions of Morocco. What are cooperative measures in response to the COVID-19? COPAC, Judah, uh, announced its contribution of uh, of uh, 10 million MAD, 10 MAD million to the National Fund for the Management and Response to the Pandemic. COPAC maintain, maintain a normal course of production in favor of people involved in the company, especially its 20,000 small farmers. Copac Juda assured all its employers of its commitment to maintain the jobs, to maintaining the jobs and salaries of all employers during 
this difficult circumstance. Copac Juda announced its intervention to serve 3,000 fam uh, 3, families with basic necessity for a month. Governments and institution measures in uh, response to COVID-19. We have some measures like a three parties alliance public private civil so society, uh, distribution of solidar uh, solidarity baskets to play it uh, totally uh, of rural cooperative products to needy family, more than uh, 4,000 uh, baskets in the region of Casablanca, Agadir, and more than 50 cooperatives. In May 2020, the Ministry of Solidarity, Social Development, Equal, uh, Equality and Family, uh, in partnership with the Social Development Agency, developed an online market, marketplace called ADS uh, Coops Club to sell the cooperative's products during the COVID-19 crisis. This platform includes all women's cooperatives in Morocco to minimize their financial uh, losses. Initiative Act for Community for broadening access to this platform by cooperatives training on technique and uh, of uh, e-commerce. Initiative Kupla, launched by uh, Mohammed VI Polytechnic University and the foundation of the Sharifian Phosphate Office, aims to support cooperative to become more resilient and innovative during this difficult condition. Last but not least, the government decides to postpone cooperatives credit. And thank you for your attention. Stay home, but think together how we can stop the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Dr. Ilham, for these interesting um, lectures. Uh, and uh, uh, I uh, am very pleased to have you today with our um, guest uh, speakers from uh, Arabic uh, countries, Morocco. And uh, uh, I know uh, uh, the uh, first language with Morocco is uh, French, but uh, you insisted to present it in English. Thank you so much. I'm appreciating this so much. And uh, by the way, you are uh, excellent in English, <laughs> not only French. Uh, so I welcome any questions uh, for Dr. Ilham. Uh, so anyone have any questions, I would like to uh, receive it for Dr. Ilham. If you if you would like to stop sharing his screens, okay. If you have you don't screen, yeah. okay. Yeah. So please. So any question about uh, Dr. Ilham lectures would be appreciated. Uh, I have a question. <laughs> for you, my dear friends. Uh, uh, Dr. Ilham, uh, uh, I think in Morocco, like uh, Egypt, uh, uh, being in a um, Mediterranean country and um, uh, Arabic country, so in COVID-19 crisis and pandemic, uh, all, not only agriculture um, sector affected, and not only women affected, but uh, the main sector is um, affected uh, worldwide is um, uh, people who have have haven't uh, um, a stable uh, income. So at Morocco, also uh, 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 regular income can, uh, regular income sector is a great affection. So please uh, give me some hint about women involved in uh, your um, uh, sector uh, as um, in is affected about the COVID nineteen crisis. Thank you, Wala. Yes, uh, as uh, uh, all the countries in the world, uh, all sectors are uh, was affect, uh, were affected or uh, are affected in Morocco, especially the tourism sector and uh, the fine, uh, uh, some uh, enterprise uh, society. Uh, 
so uh, for um, for the I I I told you uh, the uh, some statistic about my sector. My subsector is ag agriculture. I know it uh, very well. Uh, the the government tries to uh, to help the women's the the, the women's cooperative, uh, but there is some contrast. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, contrast because all the uh, majority of the the cooperatives uh, women are uh, in in the far far area or inaccessible area, you know. Uh, for example, uh, this woman cannot use the, the, this uh, virtual platform uh, to sell their, uh, their, uh, their uh, products uh, uh, because they uh, don't, uh, don't uh, uh, they don't have yeah, ability, accessibility, have, yes, yes, accessibility and the resources. What? They don't have the resources, accessibility to, 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 to the complete. resources and, and they, 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 uh, they're not, uh, they are not uh, trained on how to use the, the platform. And uh, sometimes they don't have uh, Wi-Fi in the, uh, the far uh, region. Uh, it is the like for the, the other subsector. Uh, for example, the tourism uh, subsector, uh, due to the, the lack of uh, tourism in Morocco, you know, because the lockdown, we don't have uh, tourists in Morocco. So uh, the subsector is very, very uh, the, most, the most affected. Uh, relatively to, to the, the other sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Ilham. So uh, this is, uh, your uh, lecture was the last uh, lecture for today. Uh, I would like to thank all our speakers and uh, participants. And uh, I will uh, remind you by tomorrow um, uh, lecture. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, four uh, lectures. Um, Dr. Fatima from the University of uh, uh, Sister Nivedita University, uh, India, Department, Professor in Department of Microbiology and Biotechnology. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ifria is also Assistant Professor in the Department of Microbiology, Biotechnology, Sister Nivedita University, India. And uh, we have tomorrow uh, my dear Professor uh, Dr. Hayam Nazif. Professor of Pediatric Faculty of Postgraduate Childhood Study uh, in Shams University. And uh, our last uh, speaker uh, will be Dr. Subhi Sayed uh, from uh, um, Nufia University, Faculty of Science, Department of uh, Zoology. Uh, so uh, I uh, would uh, like to uh, continue uh, joining us tomorrow and all uh, upcoming five, four days for our lectures. And I hope uh, we can uh, send a small message about uh, fines and uh, the challenges in uh, this pandemic uh, crisis. Uh, dear Professor Fukami, I over for you to, to talk and give uh, your um, closing uh, for the day, please, Professor Fukami. You hear me? Professor Fukami? She, she, you are hearing me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Dr. Ibrahim Tantawi also joined us uh, lately because he has some uh, uh, exams in, uh, in the Faculty of Medicine. So, Dr. Kuchifkami, would you please give your talk for uh, closing? Uh, uh, thanks, dear all. Uh, we have a good time for uh, the, to hear the, uh, the, some, uh, the, uh, the, the speeches about uh, many uh, the many many fields uh, from many fields, and uh, we can we can um, 
make the, some idea from these the lectures. So, and also the, we will share the Facebook or YouTube soon, and perhaps many students in Egypt uh, could approach, access uh, this, uh, the lectures, so that it is very, how to say, uh, the, the influence of the, the, uh, like Corona in Egypt. Perhaps, and I wish uh, tomorrow uh, we will share the lecture, uh, the, the very uh, the nice lecture. So, thanks for Wara. Thank you, Professor. Uh, to uh, all uh, all today lecture because we have to uh, go um, uh, live, but uh, we have some technical problems. So all lecture for, uh, today are uh, recording uh, and will be recorded and will be. Uh, uh, published on a YouTube stream, and I will say I will send this a link for YouTube or for all of us, and also to our uh, Facebook group uh, for symposium. I will share the recorded video for all lecture today lecture. Uh, by tomorrow we will go live um, uh, on YouTube and Facebook. Inshallah, I, I think so. Uh, so we can share more and more audience. Uh, I, I see some uh, participants who are registered. We have uh, over 200 registered uh, participants, but uh, for technical problems, they couldn't, they couldn't join us today. But tomorrow and for the uh, upcoming four days, I, I think the, the technical problem will be fixed and uh, improve uh, for all participation uh, to allow students, postgraduate, undergraduate, and also scientific all over the countries, other countries, uh, join us. So uh, I would like to thank all of you, Dr. Ibrahim Pantawi, with you, with us, or uh, you are still offline, Dr. Ibrahim. Okay, I think uh, Dr. Ibrahim also have some problem to hear us. So tomorrow we will start um, early, uh, and I hope uh, all of. Uh, uh, speakers and participants to join uh, the symposium. Uh, I give some uh, notes about uh, yes uh, by twelve uh, by twelve uh, by twelve uh, p.m. and uh, also start uh, by eleven uh, and thirty a.m. for uh, preparing um, for preparing the live streaming for tomorrow. So by Cairo time twelve uh, p.m. by UTC will uh, start by. 10 a.m. sharp. So uh, I'm so happy to be with you, all, all of you. And I, uh, I believe that tomorrow will be, uh, we will solve this technical problem for today. Thank you, dear Professor uh, Fokami. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Kishomaru. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ilham. Thank you, all of our speakers. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to see you tomorrow morning soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Here, what's going on? Ah, Dr. Ibrahim. So, Dr. Ibrahim, come late, but uh, come late uh, for... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Good morning, Dr. Ibrahim. From the 9.30 to the 2.00. Good morning, Dr. Ibrahim. Alhamdulillah, we're going to have a good day. I'm going to have a good day. I'm going to have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. You can give some notes for the next day. Dr. Ibrahim, you can give some notes for today in English. And we can close today's session. So please. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wala, for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, of course, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar on coronavirus pandemic and sustainable development goals. And uh, really, I am excited to get to know all of the new faces and the participants who are at today's event or today's webinar I would like to extend my special welcome to all of you who are attending today's event I believe today's webinar represents a valuable opportunity to share and exchange knowledge on COVID-19 and to discuss ways to fight the coronavirus from the scientific point of view, 
Thank you again to everyone for being here today. I would like, I would also like to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation to Dr. Wala Saad, who takes the full responsibility and the all efforts to organize such a meeting. And also my sincere thanks to Professor Naoko Fukami, director of JSCBS research station in Cairo for her great efforts and genuine help to make this event possible. Finally, I would like to thank all who contributed for today's lectures, keynote speakers from all, all, all over the world, from Japan, from India, and uh, also from Morocco, the last lecture. I wish very, I wish that this webinar event will be very fruitful and successful in the next days. And thank you very much for all, for you all. Ibrahim Tantawi, President of Jiban Society for the Promotion of Science Alumni Association in Egypt. And all the best. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. And Dr. Ibrahim, uh, uh, I will introduce you. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim is the president of uh, GSBS uh, AA in uh, Egypt, uh, in Cairo. And he is a head of uh, department in the uh, Faculty of um, Science at Mnafi University. And I'm so, uh, he, he, his schedule is, was, was uh, very busy today. But uh, thanks uh, to join us uh, in the closing ceremony. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, and uh, tomorrow, inshallah, uh, you will join us also from uh, from early um, from early lectures. Uh, so see you all of us tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. And goodbye. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Wala. Thank you for uh, Doctor Wala. Thank you for Doctor Wala. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, are you to travel? Travel on the telemi? Hi, guys. 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 Hi, he will have yes, uh, his presentation again. I will remind by tomorrow uh, speakers. Tomorrow we will have a first speaker, uh, Dr. Fatima, from Sister uh, Sister uh, Nibitita University, India. Uh, Dr. Etria, yeah. also a professor, a professor from uh, uh, Sister Nibitita University, uh, India. And uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hayam Nasib, a professor of pediatric faculty of postgraduate childhood study. Uh, Faculty of Medicine, Ain uh, Shams University, Cairo, University, uh, Cairo uh, Egypt. And Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Dr. Sobhi Said, uh, um, uh, he will uh, be Sabinari. Sabinari. Yes. Uh, he will be uh, our uh, speaker tomorrow uh, our, uh, for um, the new one? strategy of treatment of COVID-19 and the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 according to biodiversity and evaluation series this is the title of his lectures. So tomorrow uh, uh, he will uh, uh, present his this um, presentation. Dr. Wale, okay. Yes, Dr. Wale, you, can, you can send to me the link of, uh, of the Zoom. Sure. The link. sure, sure, Dr. Dr. Sophie, uh, I will. On, on, I on, on WhatsApp. On WhatsApp. Yes, I will send and we listen. By the way, uh, we have only one link for all uh, for all five days. So we, no need yes. for uh, uh, every day to register it uh, by another link. Only one link will be filled, yes. filled for all five days. So uh, uh, okay. any speakers or any participant, you can send or share the same link uh, you entered today for this uh, meeting. It's public okay. and you can share it uh, freely. So feel free to, to, to share it and propagate the link. And after registration, you will have confirmation email. Uh, uh, in the confirmation email, uh, uh, we can access to the meeting uh, so so easily without password or without any ID. So you have- Or link also, through WhatsApp also. 
you can send the link to WhatsApp to me. Yes, sure. I will, sure. I will, I will, I will do. I will do. Go, go today and uh, you register your uh, telephone and you can send me to uh, okay. the, the link. Okay, uh, Dr. Sokka, I will. I will. Oh, I, I, Dr. Ibrahim, uh, all of us have the link, so it's, it's so easy to register. Yes, you, uh, okay, okay, you can send him the link, and it's so easy to register to the uh, meeting. Uh, and the Professor okay. Fukami, would you please accept the registration, and we'll send the uh, automatically confirmation email uh, uh, with the, the link you can press uh, easily, as we all of us do, to enter the room. For uh, every day. Okay. 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 Thank you, okay. Doctor. Thank, uh, thank you. I'm looking forward to hear you tomorrow, inshallah. Inshallah. Doctor Yes, Doctor Ihan. Doctor Yes, please. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, after we finish now, the, the, um, uh, we, we have leave now this meeting. I will send these recorded event for the day. And from tomorrow, inshallah, we will go live. No need for recording. So I and I will also record the, the, tomorrow and for five upcoming day. But I will record. I will send the recorded now on YouTube. I will send also the YouTube link for recorded videos. Don't worry, Doctor Ilham. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for all. And uh, we have to leave now. It's okay. Uh, I, I will. Uh, I will type my uh, email and. Uh, I think all of you have my email and telephone number, so uh, we can contact via email or WhatsApp number. My phone number is have has WhatsApp also. It's okay. We have, okay. Thank we you. have to leave now to 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 end the, end the recording of this meeting today. Thank you.